Welcome class. This is the week six presentation for ME 121 Human Anatomy and Physiology. All right, let's see what we're focusing on this week. We have two chapters, chapter 10 as well as chapter 11. They do go hand in hand. They both focus on the circulatory system. Chapter 10 is specific to the blood and chapter 11 talks about the heart. You will find that within the circulatory system, we also have a lymphatic system. They do go hand in hand together. So the circulatory system is the transportation system of the body. If we're talking specific about the blood vasculature that meets up with the heart and lungs, that's the cardiovascular system. Circulatory just means we're moving things. So the lymphatic system helps preserve fluid balance and protect the body against disease. The functions of the circulatory system that are important to remember, it transports nutrients, transports metabolic waste, protects the body against disease-causing organisms. Let's focus now on the blood. Okay, so blood is pretty complex if you think about it. There's two basic components on the large scale. The formed elements of blood, which are the blood cells, and the plasma, which is the fluid part. So the plasma is a mixture of water, amino acids, proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, vitamins, hormones, electrolytes, and cellular waste. Specifically, the plasma contains about 92% water and about 7% protein. The rest is minute. An average size adult has a blood volume of about 5.3 liters. I'm sorry, 5.3 quarts, which is about 5 liters. Another part of the blood to be aware of is the serum. And it's not listed on here, but I want to talk about it briefly. When the proteins involved in clotting have been removed from the plasma, the remaining liquid is called serum. So it's the plasma minus the clotting proteins equals the serum. There are different types of blood cells, and we'll go through each type. We have erythrocytes, which are commonly called red blood cells, abbreviated RBC. Leukocytes, which are our white blood cells, abbreviated WBC. Thrombocytes are our platelets. So our red blood cells, or our erythrocytes, are biconcave discs that contain one-third oxygen carrying hemoglobin by volume. The number of red blood cells is the measure of the blood's oxygen carrying capacity. The red blood cells do make up 95% of the volume of blood cells. They're most abundant. They live approximately 120 days. And again, they're specialized to transport that oxygen. Next, we have our leukocytes. The leukocytes are a little bit more complicated because there's different categories. In general, white blood cells, known as leukocytes, help defend the body against disease. They are formed from hemocytoblasts which are hemopoietic stem cells in the red bone marrow. So red bone marrow has immature cells known as stem cells, which multiply and give rise to blood cells. That's important to remember. The white blood cell can leave the bloodstream to fight infection. The lifespan is about 12 hours. There are five different types, and you can see them listed on here. They are categorized as granulocytes or agranulocytes. There's three types of granulocytes, the neutrophils, the eosinophils, and the basophils. Two types of agranulocytes, the monocytes and the lymphocytes. One important thing I want you to remember, specific to neutrophils. These are our white blood cell in the blood that are most adept at phagocytosing bacteria. So let's remember, phagocytosis is the process by which a cell gets engulfed. Um, so it engulfs microorganisms, foreign proteins, and other cells. So the, neutro, the neurophils, which is the first one, 
on our list there of granulocytes, they are the most adept at phagocytoidine bacteria. Next, let's talk about the platelets. So blood platelets are also known as thrombocytes. These are fragments of megokaryocytes. They're developed from hemopoietic stem cells in response to thrombopoietin. The platelets help repair damaged blood vessels by adhering to their broken edges, so they kind of latch on. When the tissue is damaged, a series of reactions takes place, resulting in the formation of an enzyme known as prombo thrombin activator. Next, we're going to talk about the plasma a little bit more. Again, the majority of plasma is water. 7% is made up of protein, which is the albumin, the globulins, and the fibrinogen. The remaining is just a small percent made up of these other things. The one thing I want you to know, prothrombin is a globulin found in the plasma. It is actually a protein manufactured in the liver that helps with um, vitamin K. Again, that's prothrombin. One of my favorite things is blood types, also known as ABO blood grouping. So blood, red blood cells, have specific proteins known as antigens on their surface. If you have type A blood, it has A antigens on the red blood cells and anti-B antibodies in the plasma. If you have type B blood, it has B antigens on the red blood cells and anti-A antibodies in the plasma. Type AB blood has both A and B antigens and no antibodies in the plasma. It is known as the universal recipient. Type O blood has neither antigen, but it does have both type of antibodies in the plasma. It's known as the universal donor. So, an example to be aware of for your quiz. If a person has type AB blood, they can safely receive AB blood, A blood, B blood, and also O type blood. So human blood groups must be matched in a blood transfusion to prevent the agglutination of the red blood cells. Hemolysis is a term to be familiar with. Hemolysis occurs if the wrong blood type is transfused and those red blood cells break and release hemoglobin into the plasma. Some other terms to be aware of. Oxyhemoglobin. So as blood circulates through the lungs, oxygen diffuses into the blood and into the red blood cells specifically, where it combines with hemoglobin to form oxyhemoglobin. pH. pH is the measure of the acidity or the alkalinity of a solution. A pH of 7 is considered to be neutral. Next, we're going to start on the cardiac cycle. So diving right into that cardiovascular system. So within our cardiovascular system, the heart pumps blood through a vast system of blood vessels. It's pretty darn cool. The events that occur during one complete heartbeat make up the cardiac cycle. Each cycle begins with a contraction of the atria. The SA node, or the pacemaker of the heart, is a small mass of specialized muscle in the posterior wall of the right atrium. Okay, so skipping ahead, you can see our pictorial with our arrows up in the upper right corner. The AV node, so from the AV node, the impulse spreads into specialized muscle fibers that form the atrioventricular bundle. So let's talk about the conduction system. Again, it starts at that SA node or sinoatrial node, also known as the pacemaker. It's a pathway of the electrical impulse through the heart. You will have to know this order. And it's on the slide. SA node, 
to the cardiac muscles of the atria, to the AV node, to the AV bundle, to the right or left bundle branch, to the muscle of the ventricle. Blood pressure in the systemic arteries is greatest during ventricular systole. So there's a period of relaxation in which the heart fills with blood, and that's known as diastole. In the period of greatest atrial pressure is during systole. Our blood pressure is always listed um, with the two numbers indicated, systolic versus diastolic. Looking more specifically to the heart in general, and here we're seeing the innermost parts of the wall in the outer lining of the heart. So the innermost layer of the heart is the endocardium. It consists of smooth endothelial lining resting upon connective tissue. We have to remember our heart is a muscle. The greatest bulk of the heart wall consists of the myocardium, and that is the cardiac muscle that contracts to pump the blood. The pericardium is something to be aware of. It consists of two layers that is separated by a potential space called the pericardial cavity. Remember that heart is just a really complex muscle. It has sensory receptors in blood cells and blood vessels, and in the heart it sends messages to the cardiac centers in the medulla of the brain. The release of norepinephrine by the sympathetic nerves increases the force of contraction of those cardiac muscle fibers. So norepinephrine is what increases our heart rate. Cardiac output is a term to be familiar with. It is the volume of blood that is pumped by the left ventricle into the aorta in one minute. Again, that's cardiac output. Next, let's look specifically at the blood throw, I'm sorry, blood flow through the heart. Here you will see the sequence of how blood flows through the heart, and this is important to remember. The correct sequence of parts through which blood flows from the vena cava to the lungs is right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary valve, to the pulmonary circulation, to the left atrium, to the left ventricle. That is known as our pulmonary circulation. What we see here is through the heart. So we would go right atrium through the tricuspid valve, right ventricle, pulmonary valve, pulmonary artery to our lungs, to our left atrium, left ventricle, and then out of the heart at the aorta, which is the largest artery in our body. The atrioventricular valve guards the pathway between each atrium and ventricle. That is important to remember. We have to have a separation between our atrium and our ventricle. Again, we touched briefly on the pulmonary circulation here. You can see a picture of it. There is one valve I want you to be familiar with in terms of the pulmonary circulation. The valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery is the pulmonary semilunar valve. Next, let's touch on the aorta. So there are two coronary arteries that are not pictured on here, but they are very important. They actually give blood to the heart itself. So the two coronary arteries branch off the aorta as it leaves the heart. Again, it's not seen on the slide here. The three main branches off of the aortic arch, and there we can see how it forms an arch, are in order the brachiocephalic artery, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. The carotid arteries carry blood to the lungs where gas is exchanged. That is important to remember, and that again is the carotid arteries. A couple of conditions to be aware of. Myocardial infarction. It is the term for heart attack. It occurs when the heart tissue is deprived of an adequate supply of oxygen and nutrients. Tachycardia. This is a heart rate of more than 100 beats per minute. 
All right, we have reached that point in our presentation where it's your turn for questions. Do make sure if you have questions that you email them to me so I can answer anything that you may have burning on your mind. Thank you so much for your time and attention today. And as always, our information did come from our textbook. Have a great week.